I'd like to thank Paul publicly for describing me in such glowing terms. I hope I can live up to the description. I'd also like to thank uh, Richard for extending the invitation. I'd like to say to the previous speakers how interesting it has been to listen to them, and I shall endeavor to uh, merit your attention. Oswald Spengler, the dates are 1880 to 1936, offers the explanation in his very last book, The Hour of Decision, why establishment discourse ignores and disdains his work, whether it is the hour itself or the two volumes of the decline of the West, 1919-1922. In Spengler's phrase, a, quote, universal dread of reality, closing the quotes, holds the modern world in its grip. This dread invades every consciousness at its every utterance and persistently prunes back permissible language so as to prevent in advance any articulation of what anyone stumbling momentarily out of his trance and confronting the world might see. Establishment discourse will not and cannot admit Spengler because whether it is Germany in 1933 or the United States of America in 2011, Spengler traffics in forbidden words and phrases and in contraband perceptions. He invokes prescriptively such concepts as necessity, destiny, hierarchy, aristocracy, and order. He points out the vulnerability of civilization to destructive forces, and most provocatively, he names those forces. Quoting, is there a man today among the white races Spengler poses in the hour who has eyes to see what is going on around him on the face of the globe, to see the immensity of danger which looms over this mass of peoples. I do not speak of the educated or uneducated city crowds, the newspaper readers, the herds who voted elections, and for that matter there is no longer any quality difference between voters and those for whom they vote, but of the ruling classes of the white nations, insofar as they have not been destroyed, of the statesmen insofar as there are any left, of the true leaders of policy, economic life, armies, and thought. Does anyone, I ask, see over and beyond his time, his own continent, his country, or even the narrow circle of his activities? In the spiritual weakness of the late man of the higher civilizations, Spengler continues, Reality is no longer to be born. While in order not to see actual conditions, the wish picture of the future is set in place of facts, although fate has never taken any notice of human fanc fancies. The hour calls on the familiar image of the ostrich to characterize the fact obliviousness of the modern liberal mentality. Like Friedrich Nietzsche, whose successor he was more than any other, Spengler derives the pathological escapism of his age from the seemingly cool attitudes of the Enlightenment, about whose fatuousness he can hardly say enough. Spengler defines the Enlightenment's much vaunted rationalism as nothing less than, quote, the arrogance of the urban intellect, which, detached from its roots and no longer guided by strong instinct, looks down in contempt on the full-blooded thinking of the past. A type of bloodless thinking takes hold in the West in the 18th century. The liberal outlook, Spengler writes, is obsessed by concepts, the new gods of the age, and it exercises its wits on the world as it sees it. The late man, according to Spengler, acts like a mouse-sized simulacrum of the god whose existence he fervently denies, but whose role of unmoved mover he wants to assume. Guided by his theories, the late man as liberal tinkers persistently with the social and moral universes while granting no possibility of unforeseen or untoward consequence. He cannot acknowledge that anything inherited has ever justified its function. It is no good, Spengler has his specimen liberal say. Uh, we could make it better, and indeed, here goes, let's set up a program for a better world. In Spengler's judgment, the children's land of do-nothing ranks in insipidity with the world peace movement and the workers' paradise. Among the notions in service of which the liberal mentality never ceases to tinker with life, none outshines in prominence the notions of democracy and equality. The first finds its place ubiquitously in the self-descriptions of the modern nation-states, including the hangover monarchies, which are all republics in effect, and the hangover communist dictatorships which call themselves democratic republics. 
The second achieves enshrinement as an element in the revolutionary trinity of liberté, égalité, et fraternité. The anti-republican Spengler reserved a great deal of loathing for the Weimar Republic, whose demise he refused to mourn even in the same moment when he began criticizing the National Socialists, who, by the way, swiftly suppressed him. In the hour, Spengler connects democracy with romanticism and the cult of youth, die Junglinge, and with a weak, self-detesting intellect. For what underlying cause, in Spengler's analysis, does the pimply advocate of the socialist utopia seek destructive transformation of the prevailing order? According to the hour, the utopist finds society too masculine, too healthy, and too sober. These qualities offend because they diminish him, arousing what Nietzsche uh, would have recognized as ressentiment. Democratic man, in Spengler's view, is feminine and weak. He is sentimental, the subject indeed of an evil sentimentality, the prerequisite of his inclination to ressentiment. Quoting, there is a social romanticism of sentimental communists and a political ra romanticism which regards election figures and the intoxication of mass meeting oratory as deeds. There is also an economic romanticism which trickles out from behind the gold theories of sick minds that know nothing of the inner forms of modern uh, economies. In a paraphrase from Nietzsche, Spengler's rationalists and romantics compensate the guilty knowledge of their own paltriness by, quote, multiplying themselves in a quasi-sacred overcoming of individualism. For Spengler, the existing situation entails a paradox. The age is mighty, but all the more diminutive are the people in it. As senile souls, Spengler writes, they crave happy endings. Modern democratic people cry, no more war, and yet they desire class warfare. The same modern democratic people are indignant when a murderer is executed for a crime of passion, but they feel a secret pleasure in hearing of the murder of a political opponent. Whereas Spengler perpetrated these locutions in the early 1930s, they could well comment on any daily sampling of newspaper articles in the Drudge Report. Spengler's claim that the age is mighty, despite its denizens being petty, runs parallel to his observation that large-scale dissolution belongs to the mortal cycle of a great culture. In each seasonal epoch, forces come into play which thwart individual desire and betray happy expectation. This is what Spengler means when he describes the age as mighty, we live in momentous times, the hour declares. The stupendous dynamism of the historical epoch that is now dawned makes it the grandest, not only in the Faustian civilization of Western Europe, but for that very reason in all world history, greater and far more terrible than the ages of Caesar and Napoleon. The chapter entitled The White Revolution, which takes up the largest deal of the hour's pages, deepens Spengler's discussion of democracy. The demoralization of the masses, the deterioration of the ruling classes, and the alliance of the cosmopolitan mass of the people with sordid financial interests, the coalescence of these trends, which its temporary beneficiaries call by exalted names, is nothing less than the dissolution of all inherited forms. Spengler writes, the same thing has occurred in all former cultures at the equivalent stage, little as we know the details. There is no such thing, in fact, as democracy, that lovely but clinical sounding word. There is only, in Spengler's phrase, radical democratic anarchy. And that radical democratic anarchy is really only the disguise of dictatorship. Thus, for Spengler, democracy so-called is the appearance and dictatorship the substance of the state in dissolution. The hour contrasts the crowds of the megalopolis, that, quote, formless human sand from which artificial and therefore fleeting figures can be needed, as Spengler calls it, with society. The latter society implies having culture, having form down to the least detail of manners or thoughts, a code that has been built up by long discipline over whole generations. Culture, Spengler asserts, must insist on itself. 
It must exercise its prescriptions imperiously. Once the bearers of culture succumb to the sentimentality of understanding, acclamation, and support for the formless, for the alien, culture has yielded itself entirely. In Spengler's view, this has been the case in the West since the middle of the 19th century. Western civilization, he writes, offers no defense, none at all on its own behalf. While at the same time, it takes pleasure in its own vilification and disintegration. Following Jean-Jacques Rousseau, clever, all too clever people celebrate tribal crafts and savage customs, imputing to them a supposed authenticity lacking in the Western heritage. Soon those people embrace savagery itself. Those who shout for democracy shout just as loudly for equality. They are indeed fixated, vehemently fixated on equality. What is this vociferous equality? At its root, one discovers an ontological intuition in which even the tub-thumping political agitator participates, although he cannot accurately or truthfully articulate it. NVIDIA, the pernicious of which, perniciousness of which the Decalogue addresses twice, has always and everywhere to do with being, and being is always and everywhere bound up with the principle of hierarchy. Spengler in the hour ingeniously juxtaposes equality with its real opposite, which is not inequality, but rather quality. Culture, Spengler reminds his readers, is ordered intellectual life, a maturing and self-perfecting form, which calls for an ever higher grade of personality. In light of the definition, Spengler remarks how in proletarian sloganeering, quote, the fact that all men work and moreover that others, the inventor, the engineer, the organizer, do more and more important work is forgotten. In the intimidating atmosphere of strikes and shutdowns, as Spengler writes, and under the threat of mob violence, no one any longer dares to bring forward the class or quality of his achievement as a gauge of its value but rather only work measured in hours now counts as labor. Again, only the worker is permitted and commanded to be an egoist. He alone has rights instead of obligations, and he is the privileged class whom others have to serve by their labor. Have a, do I have a couple more minutes, Richard? Yes. Okay, good, good. The mass working through or for its demagogic leadership coerces these gestures to assuage its secret inchoate knowledge that quality persists even where the law bans it and public opinion rebukes it, and that the vaunted egalité of all Jacobins then and now being no more than denial and negation would mean nothing without reference to its opposite. Once the mass begins to lose faith in the flattering charade, however, a new impulse shows itself. Ressentiment, Spengler argues, must by its internal logic, the insidious logic of its lies, its self-deception, transform itself into nihilism. Now, nihilists never call themselves that. Doing so would give the game away. Nihilists call themselves soldiers of liberty or liberation or occupiers of this or that. Here, Spengler writes, the word liberty takes on the bloody significance that it has in the declining ages. In the case of liberty, the familiar ressentiment once more kicks its spurs against being. Just as society exists on the basis of quality rather than equality, so too society necessarily, quote, rests upon the inequality of men, strong natures, weak natures, natures born to lead or not, creative and untalented, honorable, lazy, ambitious, and placid natures. It is precisely through creating the hierarchies that societies come to terms with natural differences in the human substance. But the adjustments necessary to the result require centuries and millennia to refine. To the unformed subject, once the harangue about universal rights and equal rights has roused its, his jealousy, the same refinement appears, or rather it can be made to appear, as arbitrariness and constraint. Thus, putting one moment of Spengler's text in communication with another, the bloodless ideas of the Enlightenment lead to insurrectionary bloodthirstiness and the program of annihilation of the modern revolutionary period. Spengler argues for form, his term as identical with life, from which identification follows the kernel of his analysis. It is a piece of stupidity, 
as Spengler writes, to want to substitute something else for the social structure that has grown up through the centuries and is fortified by tradition because there is no substituting anything else for life and after life there is only death. That um, you know might be a uh, convenient place to stop, Richard, and uh, that'll give you time actually to say something. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention. <laughs>